welcome learners to this new session of BA subsidiary English part one session. Today we'll be discussing a poem called Love by George Herbert. George Herbert was born in a Welsh family in 1593. He was educated in London and Cambridge, elected to parliament twice and became a member of the Anglican clergy in 1630. It was from John Donne that he learned the metaphysical manner and is considered one of the prominent metaphysical poets. In the first two poems, written in the year 1610, he argued that the love of God was the only proper subject for poetry. His poems have biblical references and consideration of religious arguments. He was a poet in whom the English Church of Hooker and Lord, the Church of the Via Media in Doctrine and Ritual, found a voice of its own. Overview. This poem is a third in a series of poems which meditated on the nature of love. The first was considered to be the difference between mortal and immortal love. The second compared the love of God and human lust. The third personifies divine love engaging with the speaker in a discussion of his worthiness. Rather than the frustrated love of a typical secular poem of its time, where a male is commonly unable to fulfill his desires with a flirty object of affection, love here is attentive, generous, and gently divine. The key issues presented here in the poem is not one can seduce or win the object of desire, but whether one can accept divine love. The structure of the poem. Now this poem is written in the form of a dialogue between a host, love and a guest. It is composed of three stanzas of six lines each. This poem has a regular ABABCC rhyme scheme. The couplet or the last two lines of the stanza giving a sense of resolution at the end of each stanza. The meter of the lines generally alternate with some variation between iambic pentameter and iambic trimester. The rhythm of the poem allows for enjambment, meaning that the poetic lines, they run over to another or the next line. Now I'll be reading out the poem itself. A few, I'll be reading a few lines and then I'll be explaining them, alternating. Lines one to three. Love bade me welcome, yet my soul drew back, guilty of dust and sin. But quick-eyed love, observing me, grew slack. Now here love is personified throughout the poem and it represents divine love. The word bid, it is a past tense of the word bid in the sense to say or to tell. Now again there is a biblical reference, my soul drew back from the song of Solomon. I quote, I opened to my beloved but my beloved hath withdrawn himself. It is uh, taken from the authorized version. Then in guilty of dust and sin, there is again a reference to the Genesis where it is written, you are dust and to dust you shall return. The dust here represents the speaker's mortality and their original sin. The speaker feels unworthy of being in the presence of love. Quick eyed by quick eyed, the suggestion of uh, being is being given of being alert and attentive. 
Now lines four, five, and six. From my first entrance in, drew nearer to me, sweetly questioning if I lacked anything. First entrance, it shows the host's acceptment. Sorry, acceptance of the speaker as a guest. It is immediate. It is in the present. Drew nearer means the host is familiar and acts fondly towards the guest. He, they, are, they know each other. And so there is familiarity between them. There echoes a version of Psalm once again in the lines lacked anything, which begins, the Lord is my shepherd, therefore can I lack nothing? It has been taken from the Psalms in the version of the great Bible. All Christian symbols and Psalms and references. Next to the line 7, 8 and 9. A guest, I answered, Worthy to be here? Love said, you shall be he. I, the unkind, ungrateful. Ah, oh, my dear. Now the speaker claims that another would be a more worthy guest. The host affirms the speaker is such a guest. I mean, he is not yet sure whether he will be the guest or somebody else. And he doesn't have the the heart to be accepted to be his guest. The unkind, ungrateful. Now by using these adjectives to describe himself, he is considering himself to be um, unkind and ungrateful. Now he lacks the qualities of kindness, gratitude that would make him a worthy guest. And that is why he is not readily accepting the invitation. Ah, oh, my dear, this address is a familiar one, but also indicative of a sense of longing for someone cherished. Lines 10, 11, 12. I cannot look on thee. Love took my hand and smiling did reply. Who made the eyes but I? Now the speaker still feels unworthy. He feels himself unworthy even to look upon love. So, the look at the gestures. Now the verbs took my hand, smiling. They portray love as kind and reassuring. Remember, it is the God personified as love. So, God's gesture is always reassuring. Now this rhetoric, then again we are faced with a rhetorical question. Who made the eyes but I? The omnipotent, the omni, the, the super being, the supra being I must say. So there is a use of pun also. It alludes to the human eye being part of God's creation. The speaker can surely look at God with the eyes that God gave him. So that line is very relevant. Who made the eyes but I? Lines 13, 14, 15. Truth, Lord, but I have marred them. Let my shame go where it doth deserve. And know you not, says love, who bore the blame. Now the speaker agrees. His sight is God-given. The use of the conjunction but, I repeat the line, Truth, Lord, but I have marred them. This use of conjunction suggests that he is still unable to accept his worthiness. The speaker still feels unworthy, so he uses the word marred and that he has ruined this gift from God, which he received from God. Let my shame go where it doth deserve. That is, Again, a form of self-immolation, self-destructive. The speaker seems to be suggesting that he deserves damnation to hell for his shameful sins. There is again a reference uh, to Christian belief 
who bore the blame. That is believed that Christ died on the cross in order that the humanity may be rid of its sins. They may absolve of their sins. Lines 16, 17 and 18. My dear then, I will serve. You must sit down, says love, and taste my meat. So I did sit and eat. Now the lines, I will serve. It is used in the sense that the speaker wants to join the feast as a servant or that has been swayed and considers himself sufficiently good enough to be his guest. Finally, the host insists that the guest join the feast. The, the imperative and authoritative tone is not to be missed. He says, sit down. Then the lines, so I did sit and eat. It refers to the wafer and wine, which becomes the body and blood of Christ, another of those Christian rituals uh, maintained in the church. So finally, the poet knows reconcilement and the joy and peace of religion. Thank you. Thank <coughs> you. <coughs> <coughs>